Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 245 for Monday, May 15th, 2023. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as Pixlriffs, and joining me as always is Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. Hello, and if you would like to hear more about moose, bear, hiking plans, and getting ready to go to Spain, then you should check out the Render Distance. It's the extended version of the podcast where Johnny and I chat a little bit before and a little bit after every episode and that is available to our patrons the people that support the show you can get access at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks and that happens to be a place where you get access to things like the chunk mail dispenser that's happening next week because of the support that we get the monthly minecraft hangout is coming up on the last saturday of the month that's the 27th and the quarterly hangout which is something where we hang out with our patrons and talk about the downloads and the business of the podcast and how things are going we do that every three months uh, and that's going to be happening in early June sometime. I'm going to apologize in advance for next week's episode in which I will have not played any Minecraft whatsoever because I'll be away for uh, a week in Spain, as Joel said. But uh, in the meantime, we've got a little bit of stuff to talk about. Let's talk about what's new in our Minecraft live, starting with you, Joel. How's the Citadel this week? Citadel is doing well, question mark. I have logged in a total of six streams renovating the keep. Uh, I'm happy with the way that it's going mostly but i am also having to what's the you, word you used last week kill my darlings yeah i've had mm-hmm. i've had to make some sacrifices like there's a couple of things where this they're not lining up quite right uh i've added an additional tower in a place that has a spiral staircase in it and i just for the life of me i can't get it to line up the way that i want so the bottom of it is just weird it just it's it when you come out and start the bottom of the staircase it's just in a weird dark corner where it doesn't make any sense but in order for it to line up with the top two floors of where i want it to go that's where it has to stop so it is what it is right now um and i I had to redo it like six times but the tower itself is actually a nice addition uh so on the east side of the keep there is this large hall that had a couple of uh, long vertical windows you can't really see it too much from the the main street. You kind of have to be farther back. So it's more like when you're coming over the bridge or when you're looking at the keep from the east side across the river. Um, but it it felt a little bit flat and a lot of the space inside the room was being eaten up by this staircase. So what I did was I moved the staircase outside of the of the hall and put it on in an outside tower that is attached to the wall of the keep. And so that freed up a whole bunch of space inside. So that is is going to work out well. Um, I, I did pull the trigger and expand the large square tower. It went from a seven by seven to a nine by nine. And then additionally, the crown of it is also thicker now too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it it has a lot more of a robust feel. I don't think I want to raise it up anymore. I I went up to where I thought it was going to be. And then I added an extra block and it seemed to work out. Okay. Uh, there's enough room at the top of that actually for an actual room. So I'm not sure what that would be. Maybe the magistrate's bedroom or something Uh, but it's going to be up there and uh, that kind of allowed me to have like a small staircase inside the tower meaning that I was able to have like less of a spiral to it like it's a lot more you go up two flights and there's a platform and then you can kind of go left to right out onto the bell tower or above the kitchen and then you go up another couple flights and then you can go either across the mezzanine by the apps or you can go up the tower so I've been kind of having my head in a swivel looking for opportunities to connect different pathways inside the place it's a bit of a maze at the moment but because of the extra extension that I give myself I do have a lot of room for like two or three wide hallways which feel a lot better than walking down something really narrow and and so that's working out really well and uh, the the last thing that I did uh, because most of the time this week was spent like doing and redoing the same like two or three features Um, but the last thing that I did was like okay I want to feel like I'm progressing and I know I'm happy with where uh, the the um, the nave is and the apps is in the main hall and so I took the windows that I had designed previously and I said, okay, I need to make these work with the glass in them. I need to make sure I've got the right depth you know, happening and I want to do that both inside and outside. And so I took the time to do that and it looks really good inside. The, it really looks kind of fancy and official and it gives it a, a much grander feel. And it feels like now I'm, I'm looking less at like, you know, stone scaffolding and more like a finished window design in, in the, the keep. And that's going to inform how the outside is going to be built too, because I want to kind of mirror that kind of material and pattern outside. 
Um, it's hard to put windows in circular buildings when you're wanting windows all around as opposed to just windows on the flat sides. Yeah. So so that was challenging, but I think I managed to to sort it out and um, mirrored it actually, you know, in a cool way. There's a large three wide window, a small window, corner window, and then another large three wide window on like, you know, the four or the, the what would be the four cardinal directions. But what's cool, the way that it worked out is that inside the apps, the west has a window, but the east has a hallway. But I can mm-hmm. make the hallway the same size and shape as the window, right? So it, it really feels like it's it's a design where you just kind of decide, all right, well, this like two thirds of this is facing outside, but then this one direction is going to have the exact same opening, but it's going to go down a hallway. And yeah. so that was really fun to do and um, and try to work out. So I'm also trying to think about things like, you know, if I can squeeze in little secret passages, like things like servants hallways where they wouldn't want to take the same hallway as like the, whoever's ruling, like that kind of stuff. Uh, I just find that kind of fun uh, kind of access to different rooms that make sense. You know, like if you're, in the kitchen and you're serving something in the hall and you're serving someone in the library, it would make sense that the people that, that live there don't walk through the kitchen to get to their own library. Like they would Mm -hmm. go down their own hallway. And that's usually where people would have like art on the walls or something to show off how rich they are, like that kind of thing. So I'm working on, on like visualizing where it's going to look and the end when I decorate the inside. But for now it's more about like kind of connecting the dots. And the only thing that I think that's been frustrating has been, the roof line is still a little bit lower than I want and that staircase, but everything else is, is coming along. It's just, it's, it's taking a while because of that retrofit thing we talked about last week, where it's just like, I'm trying to add things onto a build that was done two years ago and I wasn't planning for this expansion. So I'm kind of having to like augment it where I can, but I do have some restrictions. Yeah. It's nice when you hit those satisfying moments of like, design choices coming together though like like you were saying with one of the sort of alcoves turning into a hallway kind of thing i think i think that's great the stu- stuff like that these little happy accidents that happen whilst you're building this stuff are, are always some of the most satisfying parts of building that stuff in survival and and not having a plan necessarily going in but just being able to use what's in front of you i think that's that's a really fun thing and finding like areas where you can use that like rotational symmetry inside of a build makes everything look so deliberate and that's one of the reasons i think we default to symmetry so much in the stuff that we build is my my backup dancer theory of why stuff looks good (laughs) is because if you see it multiple times you think oh yeah no that's that's intentional and that's like very coordinated right and and you, you don't necessarily at a glance see all of the trial and error that went into it and all of the kind of you know discarded ideas or the umming and eyeing that went into the process yeah, the intentional is a thing I know I say a lot on stream. Like you wanting it to look like an intentional part of the build is kind of mm. what I'm what I'm getting at. But yeah, that's that's it's a good point. And I, I feel like repetition is is good as well, uh, because it, it also kind of ties like if you can the it like the way that you're framing a door, if you're doing that throughout the entire building as as best you can, then the whole building is gonna feel like the same building rather than if you've got a door decorated and framed one way on the kitchen and then a different way somewhere else. And I think having them all together in, in a uniform way will kind of help. I mean, doors, are maybe not the best example, but like things like pillars, you know, using the same material, using the same like five count of, of um, stone wall and then adding a solid block and then doing whatever you do on top of that. Like if that's the same throughout most of the, you know, the build, then it's going to feel more cohesive and more intentional. Yeah. And, uh, I <laughs> I have some some less cohesive things to talk about because my my castle is done. Um wow. it isn't it isn't complete, but it's done. <laughs> um mm. I'm I'm done with it more than it is done with me. <laughs> I I feel like I've I've done a, what is uh, I would call a satisfying amount of work on it and mostly I am ready to move on. Um but yeah, I I was working on this in creative basically all week so I could import stuff into uh like Matica and build stuff in survival. Uh, using that as a blueprint so i've I've added a lot since the last update on this um i've added a throne room um the adjoining solarium is what i'm calling it. it's kind of halfway between a sunroom and a greenhouse um the sanctum that i was building before which is kind of a tower on the right hand side a lot of calcite and stuff i actually turned that 
into my enchanting setup room. My enchanting setup has been temporary for a year for the entirety of uh, Empire's <laughs> season two, and now I ended up moving it into a, a place that it feels a little bit more formal. Has a big amethyst roof with like a um, oxidized mm. copper dome kind of framework on it, which I'm I'm actually really happy with. I don't oh, often great, like yeah. domes when I build them, but uh, that turned out quite well. Um, there's a great hall with a copper roof and a kitchen adjoining that and a pantry off from the kitchen that has nothing in it. Like the amount of stuff that I had to prioritize exteriors because those were the things that were really going to show up on the skyline of this base. And then I found myself tinkering with interior stuff and going, no, stop it. <laughs> like the 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 one I, I kind of made the exception for was the solarium part because it's meant to be like a, a greenhouse kind of thing where they would grow plants and, you know, maybe some botany and stuff happens there. And then it's been left to just run wild in the absence of anybody maintaining it in the castle. So there's, you know, lots of great stuff from the last couple of updates that really lends itself to that. I've got moss covering one half of it so it can be a different color green from the grass in the rest of the castle because most of this is in a savanna biome. I've got dead bushes, I've got glow vines, glow berries, vines hanging from the ceiling. I've got mangrove leaves doing the same thing, all kind of draped over the rafters. Hanging roots on some of it as well to make it look like some of those plants have withered and died whilst the others have flourished. There's a whole bunch of little cool details that I was happy to fit in there. Um, I've done a few little like towers and wall sections to make the whole thing feel a little bit more coherent. And one of my favorite things was a, an idea I got to reuse from earlier in the series where I was trying to design the door for the gatehouse that's on the Great Bridge. And in the end, I decided on a door instead of a portcullis. But when I was using the portcullis idea, I had this notion of a tree in kind of like a carved relief fashion, which was made out of uh, acacia wood logs and dead coral because if you put the right sort of pattern of dead coral around that it can look sort of like the stone carved leaves of a tree and because tree imagery happens so much in elden ring the chief inspiration for this with the erd tree being this enormous tree that you can basically see from anywhere on the map and there's a lot of like stone carvings of trees in there i thought let me try giving that a go in Minecraft and one of the things I figured out was it didn't look all that good with the gate because the gate also had to have some transparency in there with iron bars and a bit more texture and it sort of looked a little too busy but what I ended up doing was suspending the full blocks of coral and acacia wood logs um, in a wall um, like a, an andesite walls basically all around it and so it pops out half a block or less from the background of it which is all just you know andesite but the andesite is a like a, a subtle enough texture that it still looks like it's got some texture to the stone but it, it manages to feel a lot more like a blank background and it helps the tree really pop out um, so from the screenshot that I've dropped into our live chat, that now has a roof over that whole section and I haven't taken all that many screenshots of it because I barely finished it at like nearly midnight last night and then logged oh, out wow. and was like, right, I'm done. I dropped all of my shulker boxes in like a, an easy to spot location just in case we end up doing a world download for this world, which we haven't decided yes or no on yet. Um, but I wanted to make sure I could leave all of my stuff uh, where people could dig through it and find what was in my ender chest and that kind of thing instead of it uh, getting stuck in my player data and not being accessible to people. I really like the use of coral as like a carved stone tree. It it really, really works in the image that you've seen. I can't wait to see like the finished stuff that's all around it. But man, yeah, that that's a really clever way of doing that, especially because you can, uh, as you've done the mosaic, like you've kind of like, made it look like the branches are kind of going going in and out of the trees like mm -hmm. in and out of the leaves like it is very effective like it reads immediately you know exactly what's going on very very cool definitely in a technique i will attempt again <laughs> i think mm. I, I it's too good of an idea not to reuse potentially even larger as well i think you get a much cooler sense of scale of it if you ended up doing that in a in a larger area i really like the compass rose mosaic i did on the boardwalk waterfront in southport and i'd like to go back and finish that area but it like you have to work at such a scale to do something like this like on the wall of a building or yeah you know i guess i wonder could be really fun with bright colors if i was if i had a big enough alleyway to do like some graffiti 
in mm-hmm. Minecraft. You'd have to yeah, plan yeah. for it. You'd have to make sure that the wall was thick enough that you wouldn't be able to see it from the inside. But if you had a big, like maybe like a train station or something, and you wanted to put some graffiti along the outside, if you plan for it, you could probably have some real fun because then you can get into like the glazed terracotta and all kinds of different bright colors of concrete for the bright colors of spray paint and stuff. Like there could be some really interesting things, but I just I never seem to work that big. Like I, yeah. I usually work at player scale, and then I I usually don't have things that are quite as as large. But I remember seeing the the things that Cub Fan uh, did in in previous Hermits Hermitcraft seasons, and they're just beautiful but massive. Like they're huge, yeah. they're football fields, you know, of of scale. Um, but it, it looks really cool once once you get it all in. So I question about the server download because I get this question a lot on stream about the Citadel being available for download, which it never has been. It's been five years in the making. It's kind of like an ongoing thing because the server is never done, right? Like I don't have like a season where we just shut her down and start over. Um, so what, like when you guys are, are thinking about doing a download for Empires, what are the arguments for and against just out of curiosity? Well, in the past, I know a couple of our folks have had their builds kind of screenshot and posted online elsewhere as other people's work. Like uh, a few people have like effectively yep. stolen builds by saying, hey, I built this when it's like a castle Whip has done in his single player right. world or something. And then he's like, yeah. well, never offering world downloads again. That's it. Yeah. Um, so there's this stuff like that. Uh, the other major problem with it is because we've commissioned an artist to do block models and like custom textures for us for right. a, a, a good portion of this series. And some of that has become so integral to the identity of the series that it's kind of disappointing if we can't provide that as well. But we have commissioned them for you know use in our own videos rather than for distribution to the mm-hmm. public not to mention the fact that it has the same problem there people can then use those models if the texture pack is available to them they can use those models for whatever they want and that's kind of not what we paid for them for in the first place. right yeah um, no, that makes makes sense with with that said i would love to give people this world just as a vanilla download as long as they were okay being like oh hey winchester isn't a dodo anymore he's just a horse you know um i would love to give people this world because of the amount of time and effort i've put into these builds and i'll do my best to show them on camera for the last episode i have planned i have like replay mod footage of basically all of this um so I'm, i'm planning on doing like a massive time lapse and people can really get to see the castle but I would love for A, people to be able to walk around it and see the stuff I have built, and B, the fictional story of this castle is that it's been put together by lots of different people with lots of different architectural styles and different ways of building and stuff, and part of me really likes the idea of people from our audience finishing the castle in their own style and becoming part of like the legacy of that castle that exists within the world, and I, I like that idea a great deal. So. I would be happy for people to like move in effectively and start using it as a base and do the interiors and like redesign a bunch of that stuff as they saw fit because it really feels like it's you know unifying that with the idea of what the castle represents in the first place. That said, yeah, I I, I think it's really uh, it's got to be a, a group decision and we are not quite at the point where everybody is done yet. I think there's a few people who still need to film a couple of bits and pieces for their own like finale episodes. But um, I'm I'm currently feeling a, a mix of emotions. I'm I'm feeling a relief that I'm finally done with this and I'm sort of leaving the project behind. As a little bit disappointed that I didn't give myself more time. I really felt like I was rushing to do stuff towards the end and at at a certain point i definitely hit that wall where i'm like i'm not going to be able to finish this so i really just have to cut my losses and do what i can and also i have the knowledge that i'd probably never have finished it anyway if i didn't have a deadline (laughs) like i find myself procrastinating on this kind of stuff too much and pacing myself through a project like this is often very difficult the inspiration only really struck about a month and a half ago that i really wanted to do this and then i built a cliff and a massive castle (laughs) so it was a a huge amount of building work to sort of make up for the fact that i hadn't done a huge amount of building up until that point and uh yeah honestly empire season two has been very good to me i was very happy that i was able to see the season out this time whereas last time i left early to work on survival guide season two but uh we are on to bigger and better things it's funny that you know you you talk about like the world downloads and and the intellectual property and stuff like that because for me i would think about it like you know i wouldn't want to dilute the value of all the youtube videos for the people that are participating in the server like that's currently the only way that i a viewer can see anything on empires is to watch it on youtube Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And if I just had access to that, then granted, I know that the current season would be over, but I just feel like when you do that, you just end up, you know, somehow, I don't want to say removing the magic, but like just there's, there's a certain, there's a crap that goes into the video making and the editing and like not showing the stuff that's, you know, the unsightly chess monster that exists under the castle because that's how you built it. Like, because that's the gameplay. Right. And I think that, I think that that's important to maintain. And when people ask me about downloading the Citadel, I mean, one, it's never finished because it's an, it's a growing ongoing server. And two, like there's a chance, like use knowing what I know now about like, you know, MC edit and things like that. I could download a copy of the server and I could delete everything, but West Hill, like I could just leave Mm -hmm. the medieval area intact and just give that to people. Um, but then again, like West Hill, the city, when it eventually is done, that'll be a checkbox. But like, are the farms outside of it done? No. You know, like it just it's a bunch of empty Minecraft landscape, your whole walk towards the city. So like I never feel like it's finished. And so for me, it's like it's never at a point where I think, yeah, let's give this out to the public and let them wander around. It's a different beast if I was to invite somebody on to walk around with me and do a tour of the town. Like that's one thing you know, compared to having other, you know, people just run around and, and look at it and stuff like that. So I don't know, I've toyed around with doing it with patrons um, because then I, you know, the likelihood of someone stealing something and, and making it, making it appear publicly that they built it would be pretty nil uh, in, in a community where people are paying to support you. So like, there's that aspect of it. I've seen that happen with satisfactory. A lot of times in satisfactory, there's a, a blueprint designer. So you can design, buildings that are combinations of all kinds of different parts and then you can save that so if you have to do it repetitively later on you can absolutely do that Uh, and then what happens is a lot of times these youtubers and um, streamers that play satisfactory will make those files which is a brilliant thing that the game designers have done the blueprint files is something you can share so if you have a really cool power pole design or like your smelter design is really cool you can share that with whoever you want or you can for example, your patrons. Uh, so I see that a lot with some of the the satisfactory folks that I follow. So I, I've been thinking about like maybe making the world available in that in that way. But I know there's something that I like about the fact that if you want to see the Citadel, you have to watch me or somebody else on the server stream. That's kind of it, mm-hmm. you know. And I like that kind of value of it. It's like old school television. Like you can only tune in to watch, you know, Friends on Thursday nights on NBC. That's not available anywhere else. <laughs> it's appointment then, viewing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it sort of makes sense to me. Like you're kind of giving somebody the backstage pass at Disneyland. You know, you're you're kind of showing yes. them how the how the magic happens. Um, it's a it's an odd one. It's a double edged sword. But ultimately, people understand what it takes to make a Minecraft series, and so they they sort of understand from their own gameplay experience that yes, these projects are going to be sort of semi unfinished, and all of these builds might not have interiors, and you know, there's chests around every corner kind of thing but yeah like i i can i can absolutely see the arguments for and against like i said i i would love to give people more opportunity to walk around this stuff because i'm i'm really proud of it and part of the reason i got into making youtube videos in the first place was being able to share stuff with people so would love to do that um but we're going to be moving on like i said to bigger and better things and that begins with minecraft java edition pre-release one for 1.20 That was released earlier this previous week, and it was time for the first 1.20 pre-release. From now on, we should mostly see bugs being fixed, and in addition to that, uh, the article reminds you that pre-releases don't follow the regular snapshot cadence of just releasing on Wednesdays, so expect a couple others to pop up this week, potentially. The main change includes coloured wool, carpets, and beds can now be dyed to any other colour. There are a bunch of technical changes, including new damage types, outside border, and generic kill. Random sequences for loot tables are now deterministic. Changes in the server.properties encoding and string data sources for the data command now accept negative boundaries, which are interpreted as index counted from the end of the string. Some of you probably knew what that meant. Me? No idea, but uh, maybe a little bit more news about that uh, further down this read. Um, The damage types, let's go into those a little bit more. Uh, Players outside of the world border are now hurt by a separate damage type outside border instead of in wall. So it's not like you're suffocated like you would be if you teleported into a wall somewhere. Forcibly removing an entity using the slash kill command, for example, now uses a damage type generic kill instead of out of world. 
the loot table random sequences we heard about, uh, the game now uses named random sequences to deterministically produce loot for loot tables. Each random sequence produces a unique sentence based on the world seed and sequence ID, which means a loot table will produce the same results when run with the same parameters in the same world. The ID of the random sequence to use for a loot table is specified in a new field called random underscore sequence. Useful news for any map makers out there. So the server.properties file was also modified. That's now read in UTF-8 initially with previous encoding ISO 8859-1 or Latin 1 as a fallback. And the file is now written with UTF-8 encoding for anybody who is interested in modifying the server.properties file. Fixed bugs of note in pre-release one. There's one exciting one here. Uh, when reaching the other side of a nether portal, the animation plays forever until stepped out of. Did we know this was a bug? <laughs> it's MC-180, so that's been around for a very, very long time and has now been fixed as a pre-release one for 1.20. A couple of other bug fixes, placing an end crystal when entering the end prevented the ender dragon from spawning, that's now been fixed. When entering spectator mode while standing on the ground, the player moves down by a very minute amount of blocks which makes you fall down, that's now been fixed as well. Melon and Pumpkins were in the default maintains farmland tag despite not maintaining farmland. Rabbits were no longer affected by jump boost, that's now been fixed as well. Entities weren't sticking to honey blocks pushed by pistons if their center wasn't over the honey block, and items were not respecting the properties of the block they were supported on. Those have all been fixed, along with a bunch of other bugs fixed in pre-release 1. Those can be found in the Minecraft.net article linked in our show notes. I was surprised with the portal animation playing bug because mm -hmm. that predates my time in Minecraft and I've never liked it. I've just assumed this is just how Minecraft it's is. It's just intended. Yeah, it just that's is. always you know, how like, it happens. Yeah, you're supposed to feel seasick whenever you get out of the nether. Now, in recent updates, they've given us the capability to reduce the intensity of like the nausea effect and the darkening effect and all that kind of stuff. And so I've taken my nether portal wobble, I guess, down to minimum. Uh, and I don't know if they've given if they've given us the chance, the opportunity to change the opacity, but either way, it's it was less intrusive in recent years. I want to say the last year or two, but knowing that it's not going to play constantly as I exit the portal, as I try to figure out which direction I'm facing, that's awesome. I honestly think they have a competition at this point going for who can fix the oldest bug, <laughs> because <laughs> that is that is a very very early bug has been around since Nether portals have been around basically, and I think that's. A really good fix. I, I do think it feels like a quality of life thing in the way that a lot of the bug fixes and tweaks have done in this update, and it seems like a much more friendly way of getting people in there. I think the the only other thing that I don't know if it's actually been fixed yet or if it's potentially on their list of things to fix, but I've seen people complain recently of the fact they don't really have time to react if they go through a nether portal, their player loads in, but it still says it's loading the terrain and it doesn't render anything yet. And then you get killed by a mob that's standing right there because it went through the portal before you. Say like a zombie makes its way through to the nether or a creeper, for example, and sometimes you can find yourself dying to something before it's even loaded the nether around you. I'm not sure if that got fixed recently. Maybe our live chat can prompt me if it has. But yeah, I think um, the portal animation thing is also really good for immediately orienting you in the nether and letting you know of any potential dangers if you've not got all of the purple particles and stuff obscuring right. your vision right away yeah 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 so the loot table random sequence thing sounds like it could be good for heavy technical players speed runners perhaps uh people looking to min max you know something they're doing in a specific area or i could also see like you know if you need to play test something and you're not on the server if previously even downloading a copy of the world and you were getting inconsistent results as you were testing some redstone farm or spawn rates or something because of the way that things were randomly happening or if you're doing loot table for like you know a piglin bastion or whatever then i feel like having that stuff be consistent because of the world seed is going to be advantageous to players that are like really digging under the hood it's more it's deeper than i play minecraft that's for sure uh, yeah, but I know I, that there are some people that are probably going to be happy to have consistent data in that way. Previously, I think every time you loaded up a world with the same seed, it would still generate the same loot. It was just doing it in a slightly different way. And mm. I wonder if this also incidentally fixes some issues with loot tables where I think in certain circumstances, 
you can end up with the same loot, like the exact same loot occurring in similar structures. Like when you're exploring end cities and you find a chest that has some diamond boots, a diamond shovel, and like three gold bars in it. And you go, hmm, okay, that's cool loot. Let me grab the diamond stuff, maybe leave the gold, whatever. And then you go to the next end city and one of the chests there is exactly the same. And you go, hang on a minute, <laughs> it's, it's just cloned. And I think maybe this is also going to resolve some of the issues with stuff like that and potentially make it future-proof against any other structures they're planning to add if they would happen to generate loot kind of the same way. So either way, it seems like some solid technical changes being made under the hood and the kind of bug fixes we expect from pre-releases. I'm crossing my fingers they don't release 1.20 <laughs> while I'm in Spain. Um, yeah. It does seem less likely. I was sort of expecting after we got a pre-release 1 last week that we were going to end up with pre-release 2 and 3 and maybe even a release candidate by the end of the week doesn't seem to be the case unless they post rc-1 sometime like today I'll, I'll be at least a little bit more confident that we're not going to get 1.20 until i'm back which i'll be happy with um and I, I i sort of said to myself if it happens it happens and you know i don't necessarily need to be in there for day one i'm in it for the long haul anyway but it will be really nice to experience the excitement of a new update releasing whilst i'm able to be around and get in there and play it right away I would agree. Uh, I think it, it is lining up kind of with, with some of the timing we were speculating about earlier in the year, which was that it would be after Minecraft Legends that was happening in April. Uh, it, we were speculating that it could be as early as May, but now that we're only just getting the first pre-release, I'd say they're on, you know, on schedule for what I would call the normal kind of like early summer Minecraft release, which is around the time when kids in Europe get out of school, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the early June. Um, so depending on the pre-release schedule, how many like last minute bugs or issues there might be as they work towards, you know, releasing 1.20, I don't think it's going to happen in May. I think we might get an announcement in May as to what the date will be, but I would imagine it'll be early June would be my guess. So I, th I think you're fine. I do think that the next pre-release is going to drop the moment that you put, you get on a plane, like the moment yeah. <laughs> that you are leaving the country for two reasons, because it's tomorrow. It also is the day after we record the podcast, which is also usually when they announce new stuff um, for, for fun. Um, and um, Serenit uh, in um, in our live chat is pointing out that major releases are usually on a Tuesday. So you'd be back anyway, even if it was some snap release and it was coming out next week, you'd be back. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I crossed. need to get I need to get cracking on some netherite collection because uh, <laughs> Once I get a release date, I'm, the, the the deadline is going to be like, I don't necessarily want to finish West Hill before 1.20 comes out. There are some things in 1.20 I need to add, like hanging signs, but yeah. there are a number of like like server related tasks that I'd like to get done before 1.20 comes out. One of them is gathering more netherite for my tools. Yes, honestly, I that was one of the reasons I actually wanted to restart Survival Guide, and which I am pretty committed to doing at this point. Um, after our discussion before and a little oh, bit yes, more okay. thought, I've kind of said, you know, yeah, I need to do a season three of Survival Guide. I'll I'll give the the season two world a quick send off, and I'm going to actually start by selecting a seed this time around instead of it just being a random seed. So I'm kind of doing more of a this is how I play Minecraft for season three, and hopefully that'll that'll stick. But um. I think one of the reasons I wanted to restart it was because the netherite upgrade path is going to be so different. A, wanting to experience that myself through the course of standard vanilla gameplay, but also because my previous information about that in Survival Guide Season 2 is going to be out of date, and so people will have to watch through those older episodes in order to get to the more modern way of upgrading netherite, and you know that, that leads to all sorts of confusion that I think is best avoided by starting a Season 3. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed that all goes to plan. I'm also really glad that Universal Dying is now in the game, at least for wool items. Um, and I'm kind of happy yes. they're keeping it to wool and beds because I've used the Vanilla Tweaks Universal Dying data pack before, which allows you to re-dye anything that can be dyed different colours. So that includes stained glass, glazed terracotta, I mean, maybe not glazed at that point, but like terracotta and, and wool and concrete, maybe not because concrete isn't dyed in the same way. But like... That there are a few different things that you can die and then re-die, and I've always found that 
gets a little bit fiddly because I use the recipe book so much, and I find myself accidentally re-dyeing something that I've just dyed. Say I right. want to make some grey stained glass and some green stained glass. I get the dyes, I get a ton of clear glass in my inventory, I click the button a couple of times, and I realise that what I've done is dye it all grey, and then dye all of the grey stuff green, <laughs> and then I'm left with right. a bunch of clear, clear glass and only one colour that I wanted. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy they're keeping it to wool and beds and carpets i think that's going to be pretty sensible and i'm not expecting to run into problems with that so much the bed thing i'm really happy about with all the beds that i've used to decorate in west hill because a lot of times you'll like you have a red bed or an orange bed and you're just like well i can't use that one i want like brown or gray or something medieval looking so i have to make a new bed dye it and then you know and if you're trying to go through different colors like brown or gray or white or whatever and then you're like all right well i've chosen the brown one but now i've have i have a gray bed that i have to figure out i guess that's just going to go somewhere else whereas now instead of a, a shulker box full of beds which i do have i can just you know i can dye them the color that i want and 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 not have to worry about keeping them or you know like if i decide that i don't like it it's it's i can bring dye with me instead of four different beds to figure out which one I might like better, you know, so that that yeah. to me is a is a good change, and um, I I feel like the the dyeing the ter terracotta thing, uh, or the the sorry not the terracotta the wool thing also makes sense because it goes with the bed set of mm -hmm. change, um, and I have previously found uh wool dyeing to be expensive compared to glass or I want to does terracotta like if you're dyeing regular terracotta it's eight terracotta with a die in the middle right like yes. that's how that works yeah whereas like We're, wool it's like one die one to, to one. one block yeah yeah, yeah. I, th I but i think it's good because i mean it's it's a good quality of life change it's a consistent gameplay change so that new people to the game will understand how dying works basically right mm -hmm. bed one die to one bed that makes sense the fact that it was one wool to one die compared to everything else is like well why does wool work differently like i, I think it's nice that they've lined it up yeah yeah, so uh, positive news, basically, uh, all round. Yeah. And I, th I think uh, pending whatever news we get this week, we should hopefully be looking at getting 1.20 end of May, beginning of June. Um, and that seems like a, a time when we can all get together and play a lot of Minecraft. Um, let's move on to chunk mail for this week. Uh, we've got a couple of emails, one of which is going to spin out into a main discussion. But uh, why don't you read us this first one? First email this week comes from Sun D, a.k.a. Steve. Armor trim having gameplay features. Hi, Johnny and Joel. I've been catching up on the latest episodes and wanted to talk about adding features to armor trims just a bit more. I want to suggest a solution to the two problems you raised. Giving armor trim powerful features might negate important gameplay challenges like Piggle and Aggro, and there might be a meta after a while, thus defeating the purpose of self-expression. Instead of removing challenges, what if armor trim provided buffs like faster mining of certain resources, higher jumping, maybe one and a half blocks, or increased speed while swimming or running? These buffs would need to not break the game or render existing gameplay obsolete, but would just slightly reduce the time spent grinding and exploring. I think the community would appreciate that change. It would be great if these buffs required a full set of the same armor trim material to prevent a dominant strategy from emerging. Plus, having different armor sets for different situations, a mining set, an exploring set, a base maintenance set, would be thematic and might encourage players to use armor that they could collect in different ways. Steve's colleagues were terrified as he walked into his office with a netherite suit to begin his Monday morning. <laughs> this is this is how minecraft steve goes to work i feel like is is this email <laughs> from minecraft steve Potentially. maybe i don't know uh, yes well uh thank you very much for the email nonetheless um yeah i i can see this as an argument like at first i kind of thought oh this is treading the same ground as we have before but there's there's a different slant to this email which is being able to give players those little small buffs and i think the most important thing is the set bonus structure of it you know having a full set of armor because that becomes more balanced because it requires making the sacrifice of wearing a chest plate instead of elytra right um my main problem with it is that we have 
two systems which already do the stuff that Steve is describing in this email. We have enchantments and potions, because the buffs Steve described are basically haste or efficiency, jump boost and swiftness, or maybe like soul speed or depth stride or anything that kind of changes your movement speed in different um, different circumstances. So effectively you are augmenting or overriding the need for those enchantments, right? Um, those are already obtained through other means. I feel like adding them as a permanent armor trim buff potentially devalues systems like potion brewing, enchanting, and, you know, the, the amount of work that goes into collecting something like a beacon. I'm not going to say that I wouldn't enjoy having haste in a more portable way, because I find myself, especially having gathered so much stone recently, a little bit frustrated with the radius of beacons and having to halt your strip mine at a certain point because the beacon radius doesn't extend past 50 blocks. But yeah, I, I do think there's systems in the game already for the kind of stuff that Steve is suggesting here, and I'd be wary of wanting that stuff to be overwritten with a new system that's just going to you know, effectively make the older ones obsolete. Yeah. What if the armor could extend existing systems? Like, say, if you had netherite armor that had redstone in it, uh, if you were within the range of a beacon, then it would charge up. You know, like, the clo if you stayed within the range of a beacon, you'd give yourself a certain amount of charge, and thus giving your beacon radius a larger radius without having to build... A different beacon somewhere else you know um that kind of thing i think could be interesting because then it wouldn't work on its own you'd still have to build a beacon but your beacon radius goes from 50 to 75 or something like that because you have the right kind of netherite armor on i i like the spirit of the email like i like that it's not like here's a make fix button and i just want you know i want you know armor trim to be this thing that fixes the thing that i don't like in the game or the thing that is a pain in the butt in the game for a lot of players i like the idea of the of the fact that the armor trim itself would be decorative only on its own. It wouldn't be until you combined a, a pattern of the same material. And I thought that was interesting too, because rather than relying on the pattern of the armor trim, it was the material that that Steve mentioned in the email where uh, you have to have like all gold or all netherite or all iron or all diamond or something. And then that would give you the certain effect. I mean, I guess the argument there is that there aren't that many different trim materials. So there wouldn't be that many effects that you could enjoy. Um, I'd like the idea of the, the armor trim effects doing something that does not exist in the game yet. So like having, well, I shouldn't say not exist, but I, I find finagling around with villagers to be a real pain. And I think it would be, cooler if you had a way to get better trades without the whole like zombie curing you know basically kidnapping villagers thing mm -hmm. so like if there was a way where if you walked into a village looking real cool and shiny in your in your um you know emerald lined armor then all the villagers are like oh sale for you like you yeah, get mis things mr cheap. money bags over here yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly like or we're very impressed by how shiny you are we will give you a deal like that kind of stuff could be interesting uh compared to the current mechanic because i think the current mechanic is kind of clunky um i like the idea of little buffs like little things that don't necessarily add up to much um like you said you know you'd be worried about them encroaching on the existing things. And I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, devil's advocate to, to the email. I think that the creativity and expression is the focus of the armor trim. I don't think they're ever going to get features. I mean, never say never, but I feel like if there's any changes to the things that are being outlined in the email, it's going to come in a different way. I think the armor trim is going to be focused purely on aesthetics. Yeah, um, yeah. Which yeah. Uh, I, I feel like it's a natural player impulse to be like, oh, cool, like an, an aesthetic thing that you said is only going to be aesthetic. What if it can make me Superman, though? <laughs> you know, mm. like every everybody wants to feel a little bit overpowered every so often. Um, yeah. And so you were talking about there just being little things that it could tweak. And I was wondering, since I'm going to say something that I don't know is necessarily true, but this is the way I think of it. Damage in Minecraft is data driven. Um, and I think I'm drawing that example from you can make custom advancements which allow you to say when an entity hurts a player and specify the entity. So like if a ghast fireballs you, you can then have an advancement trigger to say congratulations, you got fireballed. So I'm thinking 
Minecraft has a way of detecting what damage source damages a player. In that case, what if some of the armor trims, maybe as a set bonus, gives you extra protection against just one type of mob specifically, instead of generic protections like blast protection and projectile protection, because this allows it to be a little bit like of an advantage without and, and potentially stacking with existing buffs without necessarily completely overriding the need for a projectile protection enchantment or, or blast protection. So for example, I think sentry is the one that you get from pillager outposts. So what if you have a full set of sentry themed armor and that reduces damage from pillagers but nice. not skeletons, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. May maybe if you get rib from Nether fortresses, that like reduces the duration of a wither status effect by like one second, but it doesn't necessarily prevent damage from wither skeletons or anything else damaging you. It just means that you maybe you could even walk through wither roses at that point because I don't think they inflict the wither effect for very long. But it maybe just like ticks down slightly faster on the the countdown for the wither effect, and maybe even like stretching it a little bit here having the silence armor set that you get from ancient cities allows you to avoid detection by the warden for longer sort of reduces the effective radius of its ability to sniff you out maybe the silence armor comes with some kind of i don't know automatic deodorant <laughs> or something um but yeah like i i still feel like if you do a lot of this stuff, a meta emerges anyway, right? Like yeah. you're gonna you're yeah. gonna find people are gonna find the optimal way of setting up armor and they're gonna recommend that you do specifically that. And if it's a small enough bonus, then it's not gonna make too much difference one way or the other, and people are still going to go after the you know, the aesthetics of it. Um but I, I kind of like the idea if we're considering the pie in the sky idea of stuff like that happening with armor trim make it something small but something really specific that isn't already duplicating another system we have yeah i like the idea of something uh like being able to wear a certain type of armor trim and it will allow you to be more efficient or be protected more against guardians as you go and clear out a guardian uh, an ocean monument yeah. but it does absolutely nothing for anything else anywhere in the game yeah like it's it not, just... not going to prevent a creeper explosion from no exactly yeah, yeah yeah because like you're not i mean sure it's gonna be fun to wear that while you're doing your you know your aqua base or whatever it is that you're building but when you're done with that build like why would you keep wearing that thing that means that you can then change it you know and again like you, you don't have to if you if you say if the game says this game will give you a little buff against guardians and you go that is a really really ugly set of armor then don't wear it <laughs> you know mm -hmm. like yeah you can you know i mean and also for me it's just like i can count on my hand the number of times i've looked at my player in the last year <laughs> so yeah. a lot of the times the armor trim stuff is is you know not something that i'm deeply invested in it's it's usually gameplay mechanics that are more interesting to me but either way it was a well-presented argument and i i like you i don't think it's going to change much but i think that it's interesting that people are kind of like dialing it back and saying like okay well it doesn't do anything but it doesn't have to be godlike armor but could it do something cool you know like yeah. I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question yes and uh <laughs> you saying that we we're not going to look at our players all that much even with the armor trim makes me think maybe they should add mirrors to 1.21 <laughs> we'll see <laughs> um let's move on to our second email and this is the one we're going to spin out into our main discussion and i'll say uh between these emails if you'd like to email the show and potentially have your email read the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com we'll repeat that at the end of the show in case you want to email after you've listened to the whole episode uh this one comes in from 12 hour half day who is a landscape artist member of our discord and wanted to ask about some of the artistic decisions that go into minecraft specifically in joel's world hi joel and pix thank you for producing such great content i've been listening for a few months and finally thought of a question i want to ask my question is for joel you often speak about how your decisions in minecraft are influenced by your profession as an artist you mention things like color theory and composition but don't often explain them fully can you go deeper into this and explain how color theory composition and other art principles affect your decisions in minecraft i know this will explain I know this will require some explanation of art theory, but as someone who's interested in making artistic builds, I would very much appreciate it. 12 hour half day was blown up by a creeper while contemplating the color juxtaposition of a kelp block adjacent to red terracotta. <laughs> I like the whole adjacent thing at the end of that made me, made me chuckle. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great email, a really good question. And I am guilty sometimes of, of 
quickly throwing out terms that I know very well. Uh, and then I know Johnny, you're, you know, an artistic person, you're very creative and you would, would also catch on, but you know, members of our audience may, may or may not be, you know, as, as informed in art and different, you know, techniques and, and different visual styles and that kind of stuff. So I thought I would break this down. Um, and one of the things I can do is, is break it into sections, kind of put on my teacher cap. Um, so rather than me just like reading a ream of notes, I'll go section by section. And I mean, if you have something that you want to contribute by all means, like, you know, get in there and, and, and let me know, because I find it interesting how I approach Minecraft as an artist, but then how others who are artistically expressing themselves in Minecraft, but don't have an artistic background might be using the same techniques, but maybe just not realize it. Like, and I, I yeah. think that's kind of an interesting conversation to have. I'm definitely going to give the floor over to you for basically all of this. <laughs> I have a little bit of stuff I can say about when you're talking about shape and form, because right. that's an approach I really kind of tried to break down with an episode of Survival Guide that ended up with me building the museum that I built on empires. And I've been thinking a lot in terms of shape recently, especially building this castle mostly out of stone like i'm focusing on shape first rather than texture and then adding texture later so i can i can chip in here and there but i'll be listening intently to a lot of this as well because the color theory stuff especially is stuff i've always been loosely aware of but never quite got my head around the the theory of it and i'm, I'm not i'm not uh, like formally trained in any way in any of this stuff so uh, it would be really interesting to hear this so the crux of this is, you know, what do I mean when I talk about things like framing and composition, the path of the eye, color theory, tangents, I mentioned tangents a lot. Um, we're going to have a link in our show notes to uh, a piece by Andreas Rocha, who's an artist that I follow in art station. And every once in a, uh, in a while, Andreas will put out like a tutorial piece where he'll kind of break down his paintings and, and stuff like that. I use some of his paintings for inspiration for my own builds. And I also, when I was doing digital painting, was referring to uh, Andreas's work as well. Um, but he does a really good job of kind of like giving a visual guide to the kind of things I'm going to talk about. So we'll have a link to this in the show notes as well. Um, so when you're talking about framing and composition, the first thing you're probably going to hear from most people is a rule of thirds, uh, which can apply to an entire scene or something as a, on a smaller scale, like a tower or a house or, or other build. Everyone has access to the rule of thirds grid. It's usually on by default when you take out your phone to take a photo. It's it's a grid, looks like a tic-tac-toe grid, but it's a little bit skewed because usually your phone screen is like 16 by 9 or something like that. So a lot of the times it's like, you know, you divide your, your visual plane by three and you divide your horizontal plane by three. And what that gives you is these um, lines where you can line up the subject matter of what you're doing if you're composing a painting. And in the example that I'm citing, Rosha has put his castle on the right third of the composition. And that's more interesting than plumping it dead in the middle. Now you can do that. And there are certainly times when you want to have something very symmetrical. Usually it's more when your frame of view is very square. So think like an Instagram post having a very square, you know, default by a lot, you know, a lot of the time, very often people will frame things dead center on Instagram because it makes sense in a square composition. When you're dealing with something like a 16 by nine, which, you know, most computer monitors are going to be wide angle. Uh, then, you know, when you're doing something in Minecraft, as you're walking around as a player, you have that, you know, film kind of view. And so you can think about this kind of stuff as a painter, as a photographer, as a cinematographer. Um, a lot of times we talk about it, like a, from a game design perspective, like when you're walking through a predefined world like Elden Ring you know when you walk through a gate or come around a corner the artists that made that world that sculpted the landscape were thinking about how your view is composed when you come around that corner you know what's framing it what's setting things up so you don't always have to center your subject but you know you can uh, the trick is to then use other things in the frame to highlight what you want people to look at so in Minecraft when I look at a build from a distance I think about how I want to position the build as the player experiences it from the road, the portal, or wherever they're first going to see it. And in some cases, like maybe a main gate, you want that straight on. And in other cases, like the keep, the keep in my in my town of West Hill is not directly behind the gate. It's off to the side, right? And so when you look at the front of the gate, I have probably absentmindedly, because I've just this stuff is built into me, 
have created kind of like a rule of thirds as I'm looking at my town. It's probably more interesting on the right hand third, which is all the rich side with all the towers. And then on the left hand side, it's a little bit more flat with um, walls and the market, which doesn't have very high roofs. So I've kind of divided my my town into thirds with the middle third being like the main street, the main business, you know, kind of area. Um, a lot of the times you hear about the golden ratio or the golden spiral. And that's a more complicated way to arrive at roughly the same idea. Um, the idea with the golden spiral, it's it's a mathematical sequence that gradually brings a spiral path of the eye down to a focal point. A lot of great painters have used it, um, especially mathematicians uh, like Leonardo da Vinci, that kind of thing. But when you look at it, when you realize where the focal point is on the golden ratio, it's on a third. Like it's 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 a lot easier to just throw up a rule of thirds and kind of get where you might want to frame things. Now, when it comes to framing and actually focusing the eye in on something, that is where you can use all kinds of different techniques. So framing is just more or less the borders of what you're looking at. The first frame is obviously the limitations of what you can see. You know, your eyes, the frame of a painting, the frame of a of a shot in television or a movie or the frame of your, you know, point of view in, in Minecraft. Uh, but then you can use other things to frame your subjects within the composition. So going back to the example from Rosha, he's used a very steep gray mountain on one side of the composition and some dark trees, and then a, uh, a wagon and some brush on the other side with a dark cloud. And they all kind of funnel your focus into the castle, which you're looking at in the distance. And so from a shape kind of way, he's used different things to focus your eye in on, on the castle. And you can do that in Minecraft too. So think about, you know, you're walking up to a house or something and you've got, you know, a, a couple of trees or something like that. You can put like a tree on either side of your view and that's going to focus your attention on what's between the trees because there's a chance that you can't see what's behind the trees. So even if the Minecraft world travels off into the distance by putting something on either side of what you're looking at, you're going to then focus kind of into the middle, kind of just how humans work. You know, when things are happening on either side, we tend to focus on what's going on in the middle. And by doing that, you can draw attention to areas or pull attention away from areas it depends on on what your you know motivation is i guess there's a couple of these concepts that i think you can apply to minecraft building even if you're not necessarily considering the view like if if you're having trouble looking at the bigger picture these are still some principles that you can apply to small scale builds or or mid scale kind of things case in point i think the rule of thirds thing doesn't just have to apply to the composition of a a screenshot of your base for example like just a, a view of your base it can apply to things like um you know if you're building a a large door for example like the entrance to a castle door and you're not sure where to put like the lines of like bracing or kind of iron bars or whatever that are going to you know be the ornaments on this door and the rest is just going to be flat paneled wood divide the door into thirds and build the lines of i'm going to say spruce trap doors as an example because we've both done it <laughs> um, put, put those along the lines where it will divide the door into three segments and you'll find that that feels like both a natural spacing for that scale of door but it also divides things up into what you're going to talk about a little later this 70 30 kind of rule of like there's a little bit of detail in these specific places that draws the eye in and the points of interest are along those lines and then the rest of it can just allow the eye to rest a little um when it comes to the golden ratio i ended up using that spiral and the kind of tightening of a spiral as it turns around for the construction of one of the roads in my ancient capital in the season of empires i ended up like tightening in the curve of the second half of this road and i ended up calling it ratio road because i was trying to follow the golden ratio as best i could and that doesn't really show until you look at it from directly above but it turned out to also really fit the landscape that i had quite well so i think that's uh, that's also something to consider and then yeah i think this this andreas rocha example is obviously a masterclass in the composition oh, yeah. of a of a of a picture like this but you can 
approach different things different ways. Like, e even when it comes to framing, when I was trying to figure out what I was doing with the gatehouse build on the bridge on Empires, I ended up thinking, well, if I, if I make the aperture of the door that's actually open fairly narrow, it's only like three or five blocks wide, I can actually hide elements of what you're going to see behind that to suddenly show you yeah, there are structures on either side of this. The road in front of you is straight and all you're seeing is the end of the road. But once you walk through the doors, suddenly there are buildings to either side of you that you didn't know were there until you walked through the gate. And that can be quite an effective thing, taking the viewer, the the participant, by surprise uh, when it comes to hiding elements like that instead of showing them everything and just centering a subject inside of that frame. Exactly. So, and by using the the narrow passage of a gate to then reveal more on the other side of it, you're you're using frame to instead of focus your viewer on something you want them to see, you're using the frame to hide something until you're ready for them to see it. So mm -hmm. it works both ways, which is which is really cool. So again, like you're using that technique before you knew that you're using that technique. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, and that leads into a really good point, which is um, the flow or the path of the eye. And this is a really straightforward thing that you can usually do it yourself when you're at like an art gallery or looking at a photo or something like that. It's simply the path that your eye naturally takes when you're looking at something visual. It could be a landscape painting. It could be the drawing of a figure, or it could be something abstract, completely abstract, like a Jackson Pollock or something. But your eye is going to flow around the, the work in a certain way. Uh, if it's a Jackson Pollock, you're going to get dizzy but yeah like it's it, it's very active you know um and you can use framing and composition and contrast or form and color which we'll get into later to guide the path of the eye around a piece of art or a minecraft build so for example framing your bright build between two darker trees that lean slightly towards the build will keep someone's focus on the build so you're controlling the path of the eye in kind of like a circular motion people are going to like they're going to see the trees but they're always going to be drawn back to the bright red house or whatever it is in the middle. Uh, and you can do that. It doesn't have to be a circle. doesn't have to be a static point. You can make it kind of meander. And if you think about it, literally a path of the eye and a path in Minecraft, you can build paths and they help a lot with that because you as a human just naturally see a road and want to walk along it or follow to see where it goes. Uh, and then you can, you know, use the, the control that you have with framing uh, and other techniques to help make that path more interesting rather than plain. So a straight path down the middle of your town is functional, but it's not all that interesting. And the path of the eye is just a straight line away from you. It's not bouncing around. So it's kind of like leaving the composition. Whereas if you have the path of the eye meander back and forth, have it framed by something on one side and then framed by something farther in the distance on the other side, then your path starts to take your, your, sorry, your path of the eye to be specific starts to take more of a dynamic path, more of an S curve through your painting uh, or through your composition in Minecraft. And that can be done in any kind of way. You can make the path of the eye go up, down. You, do you want it to go up and down a mountain? Do you want the path of the eye to go, you know, along a river? Do you want it to, you know, focus on, a bunch of diff tree houses that you've got floating in different trees in Minecraft. You kind of want the path of the eye to go from one to the other to the other. And you can, when you think about that, you start to realize, okay, what is going to take priority in the build? And that's where, you know, you can work in the flow by saying, okay, well, I want people to look at the, I'm going to use a lot of medieval examples just because that's what I have in my head from West Hill. But like, I want people to look at the blacksmith first and then the flower shop and then the church. So if that's how I want it to go, then the church should probably be in the background and it shouldn't be bright red right yeah like you 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 want you want you you want the 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 blacksmith is probably going to draw some attention because there's probably going to be a fire or some light or something happening you know some details happening up close you know and if you're looking at the flower shop yes there's going to be some bright flowers in front of that so the challenge there is to to not make the flower shop more important looking than the blacksmith because if if you unless you want to see the flower shop first so it's just, it's one of those things where you can kind of play with it and that's what's important to remember with all of this is like these are giant air quote rules but they're meant to be played with broken and used either intensely or very very subtly and by doing that by kind of 
that push and pull of how you use these things, you can change the focus of what someone sees when they first walk into your Minecraft build as to like, do you want them to see, you know, your storage system first, or do you want them to see your enchantment system first? And you can control that by how you decorate and how you position things and how you control the flow and the path of the eye. And so when I talk about making a path more dynamic or more interesting, how do you do that? And this is where people are doing it already and they don't really understand that they're doing it. And that's with shape, form, and proportion. Proportion being something you mentioned earlier with like the 70-30 rule uh, and having the rule of thirds not just apply to composition, it applies to, to shape and form too. Because again, it keeps it more interesting than just 50-50 or everything all one size, right? So to break it down for anybody that needs a little bit of a refresher, shapes are two-dimensional. They are the silhouettes in your Minecraft build. Form is three-dimensional, and in Minecraft, that usually comes with depth, resulting in light and shadow. Think about the difference of a drawing of a circle and the drawing of a sphere that has like a shadow and a light side and a dark side. So the circle is a shape, the sphere has form. And it's why everything looks so good with shaders in Minecraft is because the default shadow in Minecraft is not the greatest in terms of, um, you know, from a visual communication. You can look at uh, some things in Minecraft that are all the same texture. Think about like a big mountain range that's got a lot of stone in it. And when you turn shaders on, the form becomes more clear because the shadows are more natural and there's a lot of math happening in those shaders to kind of give you that light and bounce light and all that kind of stuff. And that's where form really comes in. And what form does, it communicates to you visually the shape of what you're seeing, even though technically you're just seeing a flat plane it communicates that shape and depth. So when I talk about a skyline in Minecraft, I'm usually referring to shape. Is it full of thin pointy shapes like triangles? Is it full of squat square shapes? You know, in my case, there's a lot of squat sh square shapes in my town because of the towers, uh, the, the defensive towers in the wall. And so I've offset that by having a bunch of very tall skinny towers with pointy roofs. And by going back and forth between different kinds of shapes, it keeps the town looking interesting. If all of my roofs were roughly the same height and roughly the same shape, then it, it's not as, as interesting. So by varying that up, then you can change things. So with form in Minecraft, that usually goes hand in hand with clarity. It's how you distinguish one shape from another when everything is a similar shape, like a block. Uh, or so you can use it to have like a, a way to separate shapes. And that's where, you know, way back when we had Wells Knight on the show, he talked about having design depth and detail in your builds. And depth is the thing that will help you with form in Minecraft. So think about uh, a, a couple of builds that are next to one another. And if they're this, or if they're the same color you know like if you've got a wall that's that's running along and it's all stone or all andesite the only way to separate different shapes is to add form you have to bring in some depth you have to bump a tower out a couple blocks or you have to push the wall in a couple blocks and make it move around then the player will start to see oh i understand that 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 wall goes back a bit and it comes out a bit and maybe there's an overhang so Form is where you can kind of add that clarity, especially when you're dealing with something that is a similar color. When maybe your design intention, like for me, building a giant stone wall around a city, it has to be a giant stone wall. Like I don't want it to be multiple colors because that doesn't make sense for a medieval town. So I had to add, add some depth and form in order to clearly communicate the shape of what's going on. And the uh, the form was really the subject of what i was trying to do with this video i made for survival guide that ended up in the the museum in in empires it was really how can i take one type of material not texture it at all to begin with and still produce a build that i like the look of and that it comes down to you know the silhouette of the build and the overall depth of the build and that's what really kind of brought all of this together and i can i can provide a couple of screenshots of the before and after of that process to our live chat and maybe they'll make it into the show notes as well um if not go and check out that episode of survival guide it's basically i think the last episode of survival guide i did for season two before i just shifted my focus to empires wholeheartedly but 
there's a couple of elements of the shape of this which are about that triangular composition that you see in the Andreas Rocha example where it's not triangular in the other sense of like drawing your eye downwards towards the structure because the structure itself is just standing alone but the peak of the roof and the uh, gable roof, the kind of like museum colonnade entrance that I put onto the front of it, follow a similar kind of triangular shape. And all of the structure of this, all of the form of it, is in bringing the upper walls of the upper floors out by one block and having them supported below. It's in the fact that you've got a set of steps that leads you up to an entrance that isn't at ground level, it's a couple of blocks higher, and then the most important element of this build coming together for me was the decision to build mansard roofs, which I found after a quick bit of Googling are those kind of like French style roofs that have uh, a secondary pitch to them and a lot of like uh, gable windows. And so th those ended up being the key to the roof shape of this entire thing. But there were several different elements elements that came together and even when i was just trying to figure out the floor plan the the sort of footprint of the build i was a lot happier with it when the walls kind of went in and out but i was able to keep them an even size and symmetrical on either side and just kind of play around with that before i added any texture to begin with and and i think that that speaks to the success of the build right because you can look at the entire gray version of that and still see exactly what's going on yeah yes yeah. when you add color and texture it emphasizes it and i think that it's just a it's a good example of like if you use both effectively then the build is very successful you could still make this all one color or or have fewer textures on it and still be successful because of the form that you have but i would argue that the color shifts would be less successful if there wasn't that going in and out with the form if there wasn't that mm -hmm. shadow and layers and, and things and and it's it's a great example too of, of like you said of of using you know the upward path of the eye like everything gets higher and higher the closer to the middle of the build that you get so it does kind of have that triangular view the front door is framed so you're going to focus on that when you're standing on the ground um, but then I mean another good example of something that kind of brings your eye up as opposed to focusing your your eye in is something like the Eiffel Tower right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you still look at the whole thing, but you ultimately travel from the bottom to the top. And then you look at it again, and you go from the bottom to the top. <laughs> like mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, you find yourself repeating that, that process. And I, I find myself doing that with, with your build too. Like I look at the entrance and I look at the roof and then I see the tower and then I look back at the roof and I see the tower again. Like I just, I'm kind of going back, back and forth. So when you're dealing with shape and form, you know, now, now that you, you know what those are, proportion is simply the size of one thing in relation to another and you can call attention to something by you know pairing extreme proportions or pull atten attention away from something by keeping the proportions fairly balanced so this can be applied at a large scale or a small scale and this is going right back to that rule of thirds that that johnny mentioned that 70 30 about um separating a door into you know three sections so think about maybe the entire you know um, span of, of your town and you're looking at something like okay I need to have um, different proportions throughout the town I want one part to be higher and one part to be lower okay cool you've done that but then you start looking at the individual builds and you start thinking about okay you know when I'm looking at a proportion of a tower that tower is more interesting if the top third is like the top of the tower with the roof and the the window and then the bottom two thirds are just the straight tower part. That's way more interesting than the 50 50. If you want to draw even more attention to it, and this might also mean increasing the height because of the way that Minecraft works for building. What if instead of the top third, what if it's just the top sixth or eighth? Like what if there's the teeny tiny little top to the tower and the rest of it is just straight? It's going to feel really extreme in terms of the proportions right so you've made a very extreme small proportion at the top and large proportion at the bottom that's going to draw attention to it and so if you want something really important to stand out by pushing some of the extreme proportions you can say hey look at me i'm different i'm cool uh, and if you want something to feel more mundane like a bunch of filler houses that you didn't decorate the inside of and you just want people to walk by make them pretty symmetrical you know make them pretty standard and they'll draw less attention than the fancy thing that's at the end of the road 
or the giant tower that you can see in the distance. And so those are the kind of things that you can use in Minecraft by playing with shape, form, and proportions. And you can use that to then call attention to different areas and different builds. The shape and form and proportion thing is really cool because you can take it to a minute scale. Like you can, you can take the proportions of something that's a four by seven build and turn that into like, make sure it's in thirds. You can make sure that the roof is a certain way. You can layer different shapes inside that. But then when you back up really far away, that build will kind of overall take one shape. And then you can apply that one shape to the various shapes of the houses that are in your town. So you can zoom in and zoom out as you're building and kind of apply these things. And, you know, when you're looking at something and say, okay, well, that, that from a distance is a triangle shape. But when you get up to it, like, for example, your, your, your build here, your library, like, it's not just a triangle, like it's domes, it's mansard roof shapes, it's a bunch of different boxes on top of little boxes. So when you get closer, it becomes a really intricate combination of shapes. It's just not one shape. But as you back out farther and farther, it does kind of take on that overall shape impression. And when people grasp that, that's when you can start playing around with all kinds of stuff and have fun with, with different scales and builds and, and things like that. So we've covered you know, composition, framing something, kind of pushing, you know, players' eyes around the path of the eye through, you know, your Minecraft build. I mention something a lot because they bug me and they're called tangents. So in art, a visual tangent occurs when a straight line or a plane or a curve touches another straight line or a curve at a point, but doesn't extend past that point. The easiest example I can think of is um, if you're sitting in front of a computer monitor or TV and you hold up your thumb and you touch the edge of your thumb visually just so it touches the edge of your com computer monitor or your TV or whatever, it's going to be slightly difficult to figure out whether you're touching the TV or whether your hand is a lot closer to you than the TV is. But the moment that you tilt your thumb and you cross over so that your thumb is very much overlapping the TV immediately, your brain goes, oh, the thumb is closer to me than the TV uh, or the monitor. Because the monitor is a good example because it's usually only about 18 inches from your face. So that's what a tangent is, you know, visually. So when you see them in Minecraft, they can be quite literal where you've got two houses that touch one another and their front walls are exactly on the same plane. And so it's nothing wrong with that, but it can be made more visually interesting by breaking that tangent and pushing one of the houses either forward or back by a block or two. And immediately what you're going to see is you as a player go, oh, that's two different buildings. Like that's two different houses, that's two different things. Just from removing the tangent. We also know that you can add on different shapes and soon we'll be talking about different colors. So by adding multiple ways to separate one building from the next or one Minecraft build from the next, it doesn't have to be a house, then you can start to layer in this information that you're communicating to people looking at your builds and they immediately start to read what's happening. And so that's like a, a literal tangent. Visual tangents are the thing that I kind of get hung up on where let's say you're walking down a road in Minecraft, you've got a couple of different builds and as you're walking down the road, it's very difficult to see which build is which because they line up visually to you and they look like they're touching visually, even though they might be 20 blocks apart, you know, front to back. They just, they line up in a weird way. And that's why I, I frame out my builds roughly and then kind of back up and see, look, look at where they're landing. Because if I realize that I've got two builds that are, are tangent to one another visually, or what I call a near tangent. They're so close that they're almost touching. It's better to push it either one way or the other. Move something so that the builds don't line up visually and they're very clearly separated and you can see like sky between them or a tree between them or something, or cross them over so that you can very clearly see that you know the, the building goes in front of the other or the tower of one overlaps the roof of another, or it's just something that you can see, okay, they are very much separate things. Uh, and that will help a lot with some of the, the visual confusion. Uh, in Minecraft, I find that I can also get, I, I call them geometric tangents because I can't think of a right technical term for them, but it's when too many vertices on a block 
come together. It's mm -hmm. why we often look at that Hubert kind of design that we we talked about on cliffs that just looks kind of strange. Yeah, and yeah. So what that is is you've got you know one, two, three, four, five. You've got almost six vertices, or not vertices. You've got six edges of cubes all coming together in one point, and it just looks very artificial, Minecrafty kind of video gamey. And by separating them out by taking a couple of those blocks and building them up take another couple of blocks and building them down you remove all those vertices connecting together it's the same way where i don't like the corner of a door frame in minecraft touching like the corner of something else like a, a strut above it you kind of want to have a block between them and it's because visually it just looks askew it, it confuses you as to what's on top of what like is that window support part of the door or is it part of the wall the moment that you put a block between the door and the window it's separate. Like it's, oh, that's attached to the wall. The door is in the wall. They are separate things. They are not the same part of the structure. And so by looking at tangents and what they are and trying to avoid them, you can, again, improve the clarity and improve the path of the eye because the path of the eye gets confused when you hit a tangent. Like if you're following, you know, through a really cool Minecraft build and you're kind of like meandering your way along, but then you can't real, you know, can't figure out, well, can I go down that way? Like, is there a road there or is it just a wall? because there's a tangent that I'm, I'm seeing visually. And by removing that tangent, it'll be, oh yes, I can absolutely go between those buildings or nope, they overlap. I can't go that way. Visually, I'm going to go the other way and look at something else. And so by removing the tangents from your build, you can really kind of improve the clarity of them, uh, I think. And, and that goes for like within a build too, not just like the builds next to each other or, you know, going into a town, but within the wall, a wall design, like you were talking about uh, your mosaic of a tree that you did earlier. And if you had another mosaic of a tree and they touched one another, if the leaves touched one another, it would be not as clear visually as if the trees were two or three blocks apart, you'd see two separate trees. Or if you overlapped the trees and used a different texture on one tree to very clearly show this tree is overlapping the other Yes, mm -hmm. they're touching, but I know that they are still separate, separate designs. And so that kind of thing can really help as, as people are doing anything from a mosaic in Minecraft to, you know, a large town to just like looking at, at different things in their, in their build. It can also be like, for me, like when I put a table down in a room, if it's like visually tangent to like a window or something of the same color behind it, you start to get confused as to what's what, because so much of the time in Minecraft, you're dealing with things that have very similar textures, you know, like um stairs and planks and and you know uh all the different woods like if you're looking at a lot of oak it's a lot of the same texture repeated stone is a really good example you know so you can get lost in tangents with similar textures and that's why i think it's important to to bring up i think the flip side of this is harnessing them to create optical illusions which is something sure, that yeah. i've seen people do quite effectively on the minecraft subreddit there's a lot of people who do like mc escher inspired builds where a waterfall appears to be falling into the base of something that then kind of climbs up a hill and like the river feeds the waterfall and th there's a few things like that there's the illusions people will do when if you're looking at a nether portal from a certain direction you can put a lot of nether scenery behind it at an angle to make it look like the nether is actually behind there and the portal is immersive and you can walk through it into the nether but then that kind of yeah, you can only you have to either limit the angle that people are looking at that stuff from, or you have to build something that's uh, basically an entire nether landscape behind where your portal is. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think there's there's some really neat stuff you can do with that. But it starts with knowing what you're playing with, and I think that's a a really great explanation of of what tangents are. So the final thing that we'll talk about is is color theory, and I mean this is a deep and complex topic, but the basics are hue, which is color, tone, which is likeness or darkness, which is basically the presence or absence of, of light. And then you can have your primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, your secondary colors, orange, purple, and green, and then tertiary colors, which are like orangey yellow or purpley blue, yellowy green, that kind of thing. Complementary colors, uh, which are examples like red and green, or orange and blue, uh, they're opposite one another on a color wheel. So if you know what a color wheel is, um, I'll try to include an example in the show notes, but 
it's essentially like you draw a line straight across the color wheel and you'll see a complementary color. It's why colors like purple and yellow go really well together or orange and green or sorry, uh, red and green at Christmas time, right? Uh, that kind of stuff works quite well. Then you have color temperature, which I know we've talked about on the show quite a bit. Warm colors tend to be things like yellow, orange, and red. And cool colors tend to be things like greens, blues, and purples. There's also color mood. Warm, bright colors like red can be used to express pension. Uh, sorry. Um, warm, bright colors like red can be used to express passion or intense emotion. Darker colors can be used to feel calm or maybe even a bit creepy. And pastel colors are often perceived as more peaceful. So that's just kind of like the surface scratching of what you can do uh, with that kind of stuff. And we'll see in a minute, like how you can use color along with your shape, your form, and your composition to achieve different things. A lot of the times you'll hear about color harmony, and that refers to colors that just work well together as a set. So complementary colors work well together, but they can also be very high contrast. And that's where you want to control proportions to help balance that out. So for example, purple and yellow look sharp, but if you have 50, 50 purple, yellow, it is going to be intense. But if you had a wall that was purple with a simple yellow stripe going across the top of it, it's going to look really sharp, but it's going to feel less just kind of smacking you in the face because you've taken that high contrast between the two colors and you've dialed it down from proportions. And again, you can fall back on 70, 30 for that kind of a thing if you want to, or push it to the extreme. Uh, either way, you're going to get either more attention on it or less attention on it. And the only way to, to really know is to experiment with it. Cause a lot of this stuff is subjective too, right? Like somebody might look at a purple wall with a yellow stripe and think that looks great. Uh, somebody else might look at it and go, no, no, no. I want the whole y'all wall to be yellow with a purple stripe. That's what I want. They're both the same proportions, but you're flipping the color. You're dealing with a warm color as the main color versus a cool color as the main color, light versus dark. Like there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Working with tertiary colors can help simplify things. So when I was talking about like a greenish yellow, you know, or uh, a purpley blue, that's where, you know, you'll see someone that will put together a Minecraft build and they'll have like yellow walls, green trim, and maybe like a greenish blue roof or something like that. So they're staying all kind of like in a, in a coolish kind of tone. They're keeping cool colors, but they're also staying with colors that are right next to one another. They're not jumping to a magenta or a red, you know, uh, or, or going into something more intense like a purple. They're kind of sticking with that kind of tertiary section. You can sort of look at it like, you know, looking at the color wheel between like 12 and and three o'clock or between three o'clock and six o'clock. You can kind of see how when you look at them all together, they go together and you've seen all kinds of different things in your life, you know, whether it's flowers or patterns on clothing or things like that, that just look good together because there's a lot of pink and purple or whatever going on. Color separation or the lack thereof comes into play when two colors are close together on the color wheel or when two colors are too close in tone. So that's when your yellow green and your yellow are not separate enough that they don't look like two different colors. They kind of look the same. And there's a couple of blocks like that in Minecraft um, that, that you can get into where you're just like, well, they don't really go the best together. Like some of the green terracottas with the green concrete, like they sort of look the same, but then they don't. And if you want to have more separation, you'd be better off to choose greens that have a, a little bit more distance between them on the color wheel to help you use two different colors, depending on what you want to do. Now, sometimes you want them to be close together. If you're doing something like a lot of natural foliage, then you kind of want all the different greens to kind of feel like they're one environment. And if you start to get greens that are too far outside of that, like putting a sweet berry bush in with um, azalea bushes, they're very different greens. The, you know, the, the uh, sweet berry bush is very green, blue, very cool uh, compared to the more warm, yellowy green of an azalea bush so it's going to stand out if that's what you want great if it's not what you want you got to find something else to put there the other thing that will bring two colors too close together is the tone or the presence or absence of of light and so if you have something where two colors are completely different colors like a green and a 
we'll say a blue and they're not tertiary, like they're far enough away that they're different, but they're both both like quite dark and you use a lot of them in your build, you're going to find that the whole build just feels dark or what we'll say on the show often is muddy. And that's where there's too much of one tone kind of going through. There's not enough contrast in the build. And that's where, you know, you'll benefit from adding in something that's much lighter. So even if you want to stick with your green and blue motif, find a lighter blue or work in something else into the build that will bring the lightness up, like, you know, using your whites, or your blacks, or your more neutral grays will help separate things like that. In Minecraft, block textures can be very complicated, but overall, you can usually identify them with the principles above and apply that to your advantage. So you can look at something like Blackstone and see that there's a lot of blue or purple in it. And you'll understand why it it looks good next to something like an orange, you know, or or looks good some, next to something uh, that's in its kind of tertiary value. So orange being complementary, you know, in, in that range to blue and purple. But, you know, if you put it next to something that's green, it, it might not feel the best. Like it, it might fight a little bit. Uh, or if you've got a build that's mostly warm colors and you start to use blackstone because you think it's black and then you realize why isn't this working it's because there's a lot of cool colors in it and it's not necessarily going the best you know in terms of the color harmony so you can figure out which blocks in minecraft are warmer and cooler by kind of like really looking at at what colors are within the texture versus how the color read how the texture reads from a distance so quartz is a really good example of a warm white if you stick quartz next to a concrete white block the concrete white block is going to look almost blue because it's such a cool white it's such a neutral white um, think about it between the difference of the light bulbs in your house like the the warm light you know the tungsten type light versus like the daylight the leds you know very different colors uh in terms of how they project light into the room and so that kind of stuff being aware of how a minecraft block reads from a color temperature, you know, a color contrast and a color mood uh, will kind of help you decide, you know, how you want to put things together. And remember shape and proportions. You can combine that same theory with colors and either dramatically or subtly control the path of the eye. So again, using things like a 70-30 rule, taking a look at the path of your eye as, as it goes over a build or through a, a series of builds, and remember, I was talking about, you know, not making that church bright red. That's, you know, that will draw a lot of attention to it. So you'd want to consider your color contrast. You want to consider your color mood. Uh, and, you know, you can do things like, you know, take something from um, a cool blue. And if you've if you've worked something as a, as a cool blue and you're like, well, I want it to be more evil. I want it to feel more sinister. Well, what shapes are sinister? You know, like you can make a happy round bubbly blue build. Or you can make a pointy, you know, dark blue build, and they're going to have different emotional responses from different people. Now, again, it's all subjective. Some people might be in love with pointy blue, you know, roofs and things and have them, they might feel very cozy because <laughs> it reminds them of home. I don't know. But those are the kind of like the general rules of thumb with color theory. Again, it's a huge, huge, deep topic. I'll have a link to a book that I really like called Color and Light, A Guide for the Realist Painter. Uh, it is by, oh gosh can't remember, uh, James Gurney. And uh, it's it's written for artists, but the way that it talks about light, the way that light works and the way that color works is, is an interesting way, I think, to look at a game like Minecraft where you're essentially painting in 3D with blocks as how I see it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, by by having that kind of information I, and it, I mean, it's just it's just a good example. I mean, this information can be found on YouTube and, and stuff like that as well. Um, but it, it really changes the way that I look at a Minecraft composition, um, because of my, my background as an artist and those tools are, are available for people to, to research and, and try to figure out on their own. Um, but I, uh, I really appreciate the question because sometimes I know I take for granted, you know, having been doing art for 20 years, that the kind of stuff that's just innately in my brain when I go to do something. I remember when I used to stream art, uh, people would ask and say like, hey, is, is this a stupid question? It's like, no, of course not, because I'm doing about 30 things in my brain at once while I'm doing this art piece of artwork. And I'm not necessarily always stopping to, 
describe every single step and decision that I've made, you know? And so it's important to, to ask those questions and it's, it's fun for me to talk about. Yeah, there's the stuff that I've noticed just going through the castle build on empires that I noticed about the way you use different gray blocks. Like we've been jokingly calling this castle grayscale the the whole time, but like there are so many different grays in Minecraft now, and you think of gray as a cool color a lot of the time. If if you imagine a gray in your head, it's probably not the warmest thing in the world. But then you start looking at things like the coral blocks, the dead coral exactly. that I've been using for this tree relief, and it's actually very warm like it's got a lot of red undertone to it and i think that's something you don't really think of if you put a coral block down like a dead coral block in isolation but then if you start putting it next to all of the other gray blocks suddenly it's a very different color gray i think the other really easy example of this is in badlands biomes if you go and take some terracotta from a mesa if you go and get the white terracotta from there next to all of the other warm colors it looks really white like it looks like a pure white block and then you place it down anywhere else especially next to other white blocks like wool or concrete but especially if you just put it down like in a, a plains biome somewhere else and it doesn't have the context of all of the reddish hues around it you end up thinking well that's more like a, a you know a white guy flesh color you know <laughs> that's that's a yeah. little bit more pink than i expected it to be because it doesn't have like a red terracotta and regular like orange terracotta that kind of like flower pot hue terracotta all around it and that's the the mind-blowing stuff about this is your eye can sort of be tricked into that relative color thing that i, I feel like is once you've started to notice the way you can use that in builds i think that's a really important skill to learn have you ever seen those optical illusions where the same red box will be in the center of two different squares. And then those two different squares are different colors. Mm -hmm. And yeah. because the background is a different color, the red looks like it's a different hue. It's like more orange on one side and it's more purpley blue on the other. But all that's happening is that your eyeballs are actually mixing the light you're seeing from the two different colors together and giving you the optical illusion that the red square is different. But if you dropped it into Photoshop and you eye dropped it, you'd find out it is exactly the same red. It's just that visually, you know, things are, are changing, you know, for you. And I'd imagine that you probably experienced a lot of that when you were playing RTX in in um, Bedrock because of the way that light was working in that engine and how like light passing through a green stained glass block would then change the color of the wood right? You'd get a green shadow or a green beam of light hitting the orange wood or, or whatever you had, creating a completely different color, right? On, yeah. on the ground, because not only is it changing the color, it's increasing the lightness of it. So it's taking this orange wood, adding a layer of green and increasing the tone towards white, as opposed to going dark, you know, in a shadow. Um, I use it all the time in artwork when you know, you think about cool colors also kind of recede visually on a flat surface and warm colors will kind of pop forward and, and advance. And so when you do light on, on a, on a canvas, you know, you want to paint with, you know, a lighter color or something that goes towards a yellow or an orange. But when you paint a shadow, shadows are not usually painted with, with black or gray. They're usually a dark blue or a dark purple because again, cool colors recede. And the world is filled with light bouncing around everywhere. So when you're doing visual art, you want to kind of try to communicate that. But you can have the same sort of fun in Minecraft. Like if you want things visually to be more important and be seen first or pull forward, then, you know, not only could you add depth and form to bring that part of the build closer to you, you could then put a cooler color on the bottom that's away from you and a warmer color uh, on the top towards you. And that doesn't have to be primary blue and yellow that that could be, you know, like you said, you could have a warmer gray in, in the coral, the de dead coral blocks. And then you could have a cooler gray, you know, um, something that's like an andesite or, um, deep slate is also a, a cool and a darker gray. And so by combining those kind of things with form and shape, you can really push things and really make things, I hate to use the word pop but you know what i mean when you walk through something and you see something of a minecraft build and it immediately stands out like the first thing that you see is like that cool balcony that someone built or whatever and a lot of the times it's because of the block choices the form 
and the way that it's kind of proportioned, it's, it's going to stand out as like, this is the key aspect. This is the thing that's the most important part of the build. And if you analyze something, there's a good chance that you're going to see a lot of these tools being used to focus you on that, that specific thing that you noticed first. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I feel like everyone's got homework now. <laughs> <You need> to... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Like that's it's been an education and hopefully people have gotten a lot out of this. If you've had questions about that kind of stuff, hopefully some of them have been answered. If you have more questions, good. Write into the show. We would love to answer more questions like this. It'd be uh, great to get some more content like this out there. Uh, but that is where we're going to wrap up this episode of The Spawn Chunks. Thank you so much for listening. You can find some more information about our show and links to some of the stuff that we talked about today over at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show is composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can visit patreon.com slash thespawnchunks to join our community, where pledging at any level will get you an invite to our patrons only discord chat you can participate in things like the live show recordings that happen every week in discord the monthly minecraft audio hangout and you can listen to the render distance the extended version of the podcast we currently have 316 patrons which is up three from last week as always there's always room for more special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons who help make the show happen hunter 555 jumbo sale and yitz thank you for your support on this episode Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just tell a friend about The Spawn Chunks and that they can find it on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and even YouTube. Make sure to leave a rating and a review on your favorite platform. Maybe even leave a comment on a YouTube video. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is linked at thespawnchunks.com. And the patron-only RSS feed is where you can find the render distance. That's the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixlriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixlriffs, which I admit has been quiet for the last few weeks. But the Empire's SMP finale, a final wrap-up for the Survival Guide, and then Survival Guide Season 3 will all be happening over there once I'm back from Spain. Expect a few other things to pop up here and there as well. I also stream three days a week on Twitch, once again, taking a break while I'm away, but going to be back to it, uh, probably with some Minecraft bingo and a couple of like filler things here and there whilst I prepare Survival Guide and uh, maybe, hopefully, we get to do some 1.20 searching as well. Um, I'm also the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which continues apace. You can find us through a quick YouTube search. And aside from that, I'm at Pixelrifts on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything I'm doing online is at joelduggan.com, including a link to the Citadel Cafe, my podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream every day but Monday, Lego on Fridays, a new satisfactory stream on Wednesdays. The rest of the time, we continue to work on the keep in West Hill in Minecraft. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, or is that in the eye of the beholder? <laughs>